Good morning and welcome to our viewers around the world. I am Hussain Haqqani, Director for South and Central Asia here at the Hudson Institute. Almost two decades after American-led coalition forces went into Afghanistan to eliminate Al-Qaeda's sanctuary provided by the brutal Taliban regime, and one year after the United States signed a peace agreement with the Afghan Taliban, uh, two months into the Biden administration, we want to have a discussion on where things stand in relation to Afghanistan. Uh, the Biden administration has slowed down the American rush to the exit in Afghanistan, and the State Department says all options remain on the table regarding the withdrawal of American troops, and that they have not made any final decision about America's forced posture in Afghanistan. At the same time, it remains a reality that most people in the United States uh, want this long engagement of the United States, military engagement of the United States to come to an end. Uh, in early March, in a letter to President Ashraf Ghani, Secretary of State Tony Blinken proposed a UN-led peace conference in Turkey aimed at forming an inclusive Afghan government. Uh, this conference is supposed to complement a separate meeting among envoys from the US, China, Russia, Pakistan, Iran, and India to discuss a unified approach to supporting peace in Afghanistan. The Taliban have not kept their end of the bargain so far. Uh, there has been no reduction in violence from their side in Afghanistan since their agreement with the United States. And there are those who think that the agreement was a mistake. Instead, the US should talk more to the government in Kabul. Today, we are fortunate to have with us today His Excellency Hamdullah Mohib, the National Security Advisor to the President of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan since 2018. Uh, Dr. Mohib was Afghanistan's ambassador to the United States from 2015 to 2018. And before that, he served as deputy chief of staff to the president of Afghanistan. He understands he belongs to a younger generation of Afghanistans, and he understands their sentiment. Uh, these are young people who saw the, either saw the brutality or know of the brutality of the Taliban when they controlled Afghanistan before 9-11 and do not want it to be repeated. And many of them are also critical of the policy that has led to a longer engagement of the United States that might then might have been necessary and the idea of a hurried exit. So Ambassador Mohib, I would like you to make some opening remarks and then we can start having a discussion. What is the road to peace in Afghanistan in the view of the government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan? Thank you, Ambassador uh, Hussain Haqqani, for your opening and introduction. Um, I would also like to take this moment to say hello to friends, um, Afghan compatriots, and colleagues from my time in DC. Um, this is a very timely event to discuss some very important issues uh, and matters that are currently in, in the headlines. And I thank you, Ambassador, uh, and the Hudson Institute South and Central Asia program for this opportunity. The Afghan government has been at the center of peace efforts for the past few years, and we have had some very important milestones to that effect. The peace law agenda of April 2019, in which a broad section of Afghan society came together from across the country to deliberate on what questions of peace are and, uh, and, and answer them and result in the that resulted in the green light to proceed with negotiations with the Taliban. This was an important occasion where the government's mandate to engage in talks was formally endorsed by the nation. Accordingly, we took bold steps in this direction. Fast forward to 2020 after the US Taliban deal was announced and the Afghan government had to make tough decisions to release the um, hardened Taliban convicts, we organized another peace law agenda in August 2020. On this occasion as well, the 4,000 Afghan representatives from across the country deliberated for three days and offered an olive branch to the Taliban, agreeing with the release of their convicts in exchange for the freedom of Afghan national defense and security forces held hostage by the Taliban. The Afghan negotiating team, a diverse and empowered group of 
uh, individuals, men and women, and members of the minority, have engaged the Taliban with consistency and urgency to make real progress on issues of substance that affect the Afghan people directly, such as a ceasefire, issues of humanitarian access, the end of targeted terrorism against members of the media and civil society. The Taliban, whose cohort was touted initially as empowered to make important decisions on peace, this is the Doha cohort, have turned out to be underwhelming, both in their willingness to make tough calls, but also in the seriousness of their engagement. They have demurred, evaded, dragged their feet, and even avoided substantive engagement. We saw the most egregious example of this in January this year. The two negotiating teams ended round one and decided to reconvene on January 5 after a break. But while our team made it to Doha at the appointed day to start the talks, the Taliban were nowhere to be seen. For a few days, literally nobody had any idea of their whereabouts. 15 members of the Taliban on the UN sanction list went out. It turns out they were taking tours of Taliban suicide academies in Pakistan and visiting their injured fighters in Karachi. Then they flew to Moscow and Tehran. In this way, they used the privilege of UN Security Council travel exemptions to avoid negotiations and maintain secret rendezvous with their terrorist cohorts across the Durand Line. And when the group returned to Doha 20 days later, they were singing a different tune. Instead of talking about peace, they were talking preconditions to negotiations, something in the air in Quetta and Karachi that I guess changes your thinking. All of this, of course, happened as the Taliban's terrorist outfits were prosecuting an all-out war against Afghan state and society, targeted terrorism against activists, journalists, judges, prosecutors, and civilians. Under the circumstances, under this circumstance, the Afghan government is very clear in its positions. One, we're pursuing all possible avenues to get to dignified and lasting peace. We will not be the first to pull out of negotiations. The judgment of history and the need of the hour would not support that. But we're also meeting Taliban's terrorism with tough-minded pragmatism on the battlefield. We're not turning the other cheek. On the international level, we're, all, we're, we're using all options on the table, including pushing for a review of the UN travel exemptions to prevent abuse and misuse, and proposing for listing key Taliban members who have planned, directed, and executed the escalation of their terrorism. The government of Afghanistan is also actively pursuing a regional approach to bring about um, consensus among our neighbors and regional actors around the common denominator of counter-terrorism and counter-narcotics, which are shared threats. We're also pursuing aggressive regional connectivity and energy transit projects. Using Afghanistan's status as a land bridge between South and Central Asia to build on common denominators and appeal to the self-interest of our neighbors. Not only that, we're also going further afield, traversing the Lapis Lazuli route to get to the Caspian Sea and European markets. President Ghani's policy of multi-alignment, whereby we enhance our alignment of interests with all our regional and global partners, but avoid becoming a party to their disagreements and disputes, is the guiding principle of our foreign and national security policy. Mutual respect and interest and trust will enable us to achieve the end state of a sovereign, united, peaceful, and democratic Afghanistan capable of expanding the gains of the past 19 years. 
This end state, articulated by President Ghani, is also supported by our key partners and allies, including our foundational partner, the United States, um, allies in NATO, and partners in the EU. As announced by my office and the White House after my call with NSA Sullivan on January 22nd, Afghanistan maintains close ongoing dialogue and consultation across various levels with the United States, involving both NSCs and other channels, including with Ambassador Khalilzad. We welcome the restoration of the traditional channels of bilateral relations, and through these consultations, we are actively feeding into the ongoing U.S. political review. As part of these consultations, the government has shared several key policy documents that share our view on various important aspects of our bilateral relationship, including peace and counterterrorism. With respect to high-level diplomatic initiatives, such as the event in Turkey, the government is of the opinion that we will remain open to any initiative that could take us closer to the goal of a dignified peace in a democratic, unified Afghanistan capable of preserving our gains of the past 20 years, including women's rights and the rights of minorities. Thank you, Ambassador, again for your time. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your time. Uh, let me just begin by asking a question that everyone uh, in Washington is asking. Is the Afghan government prepared for some kind of power sharing with the Taliban as the price for peace? And if so, on what conditions? Well, let me say that, that we are willing to make any sacrifices that are required for a durable peace in Afghanistan. Um, starting with power sharing. But is, it, is power sharing our real problem? We find uh, a lot of uh, uh, disagreements with the Taliban on multiple issues. As our negotiating team in Doha has found out, um, that we have um, uh, differences of opinion on foreign policy, on domestic policy, on the rights of women, on, on the rights of minorities. Um, we, we have differences of opinion on how we treat um, our, um, yeah, uh, uh, our neighbors and, and you know, what, what they would be allowed to do in, in the relationship and the partnerships that need to be held. So I think that if power sharing is the only uh, um, uh, issue that we have to discuss, it is the easiest to get through because you know, it's, it's structural, we can get down to uh, uh, easy division of uh, responsibilities or perhaps power, and if, if that's all. But this is a very elitist way of looking at the problem. Um, it doesn't solve what the Afghan people want, and that is you know, a, a stable Afghanistan with a government uh, and a system uh, that uh, uh, answers to their demands and their needs. Um, and for that, we must have a, a, a rigorous and, uh, um, uh, and substantive uh, negotiation with the Taliban uh, on first defining um, how we're going to uh, view our policies, domestic and foreign, um, and, and what they, what, how our people will see our systems in the future, and then get down to the power sharing part, which I think is the easiest part that we would have to deal with. So are you saying that the Taliban have so far shown no flexibility in their ideological and philosophical outlook, and they still have the same views that they used to have with some modifications, and that is what is actually holding up the talks? Absolutely. I think um, I, 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 you know, we, our negotiating team that has been engaging with the Taliban reports back to us that um, they don't see any change in Taliban from the time they were uh, they, they, the, the little stunt that they had in their, during their regime. So we we are yet to see the change in um, in Taliban's um, posture, in, in Taliban's opinions, in Taliban's policies um, um, that we all hoped would come because there was a lot of buzz around a changed Taliban. We don't know what that changed Taliban looks like yet because we haven't seen a change. 
uh, the, there has been a lot of criticism of President Ghani for not being inclusive, not about the Taliban, but about non-Taliban uh, political leaders of Afghanistan. And some of that criticism is spilling over into the American media. There was an article very recently uh, in Newsweek, which suggested uh, by, by a former aide to former President uh, Karzai, that suggested that President Ghani was somehow the obstruction. Uh, how do you explain that? And what is your response to those criticisms? Well, our government, as you know, was formed um, after uh, the elections last year. Um, and um, and post that election, we had uh, serious discussions and negotiations with the, the main um, uh, opposition leader, Dr. Abdullah, who is now the head of the um, High Council for uh, National Reconciliation. And um, as a result, we had a power sharing uh, kind of an agreement um, and 50% uh, of the cabinet seats went to uh, Dr. Abdullah's uh, um, allies. And they're currently in their places. Um, the cabinet uh, is, uh, is, is split 50-50. Um, uh, and and all the and Dr. Abdullah leads the main efforts on peace uh, in that council includes everybody, including government members that sit in that council to uh, discuss the future of our country. Um, I think um, we have been the most consultative uh, we can possibly do, do be. Um, uh, President Ghani consults all the leaders um, when there is a major event. Uh, but, you know, the responsibility of day-to-day -day activity of the government is the responsibility of the government. Right? That's what people voted President Ghani into office, and that's why we're sitting here doing what we have to do late into the night, is to deliver on those um, uh, activities. Um, and, and this is a responsibility. I think uh, some members uh, uh, perceive inclusivity as giving them share in, uh, in, in, in the responsibility of the governance, which is, which is not feasible. Are they engaged and have they been consulted? Um, on major issues, absolutely. We think that that's not only um, uh, uh, an important thing to do, it's necessary to ensure lasting peace in Afghanistan. We want to make sure that all opinions are, um, are considered um, when we make decisions, because uh, in the end, history will remember us by the decisions we make, and those decisions need to be reflective of all walks of life. And sometimes, uh, that means we have to make some tough decisions um, and include other people that perhaps are not uh, 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 all on the same page um, in the Afghan opposition. This is a republic as anywhere else. We have, um, we have lots of different voices and uh, sometimes um, uh, giving space to one voice um, also can, uh, can bring us criticism from others who oppose it. So basically, you're saying that uh, Afghanistan's friends and those concerned about security in Afghanistan should not be too concerned about this elite sniping uh, in Kabul, and that that's just par for the course in terms of how political manipulation and machination takes place. Well, you know, I think um, sometimes we feel that uh, you know, uh, the expectation of the international community on our friends from Afghanistan um, is, uh, is contradictory. Uh, on the one hand, they want us to be democratic, uh, uh, so and hence we spend so much time on elections, policies, the parliament and other, the, the, um, uh, the normal procedures and normal way of business for a republic to do. Uh, and then, uh, at the, you know, at the other extent, they expect us to act like a, uh, like a dictatorship, where we can dictate uh, uh, to people more on how and what they should act. Um, the reality is that if, if it, we are a democracy, there ought to be different voices, there ought to be criticisms. Uh, but does it mean that criticism is right? Um, every criticism is not the you know, work the same. Uh, we have to evaluate uh, what we are hearing and um, and understand that um, you know, where it's coming from and, and how factual that criticism is. Um, we unfortunately have a very active political society um, and there is nothing else for them to do. Uh, in the United States, you have these think tanks where former politicians can, um, can join and be uh, part of uh, the dialogue. 
In Afghanistan, that doesn't exist. The only way to remain um, um, uh, active and, and of value is if you are seen as an opposition. And uh, so you must create criticism sometime, even if it's not factual. Okay. You, you, you spoke about the Republic several times. Uh, the Taliban say that the Republic is not acceptable to them that they want the recreation of the Islamic Emirate. In fact, there have been some statements saying that the legitimate ruler of Afghanistan is the Taliban Amir. And therefore, uh, all, all that is to be negotiated is the withdrawal of foreign troops. Is that a more fundamental issue than people sometimes understand and talk about uh, in relation to Afghanistan in, and, and the peace process in the US? I, I will I will take that in two parts. That question: one, you know, a leader must be among its people and must be seen. No one has seen Taliban leaders, not just the Amir that they claim, uh, but um, you know, even lower level uh, uh, officials have not been seen by the Afghan people. They don't know what they look like. They don't know where they live. Uh, well, they do know where they live, but uh, in hindsight. They, um, uh, they don't know what their uh, financial situation is, how they live, um, what are their values. Uh, all they know them through is names and violence. Um, and that's, uh, that cannot be called legitimate leadership um, by any means as a people. And then when it comes back to the republic's question, this is not um, something we, um, we're just proposing because we are here in, in a government. This is not a government position. Again, this is the position that the people voted for and are and want to see. Uh, people fear Taliban. They don't want the Taliban to do. They, they fear that. Uh, they want to see their, uh, their, their interests uh, reflected in the government and they want their voices being heard. Um, so the Republic provides an opportunity for all groups to come together. Taliban is not the only uh, group in Afghanistan, the, not the only reality of this country. It is a reality, but a part of it. You know, the government or the Republic represents Jumbishi Islami, Jamiat Islami, Hezbi Islami, uh, and then it will have a place for Taliban, but it also represents other democratic groups and, and parties, civil society, media, and, and all of that um, has a space in the Republic for. The reason we insist on the Republic is because it can represent or, or provide opportunity for all of these groups to peacefully uh, converge um, and, and create a system that is answerable to the Afghan people. The Taliban's emirate is not accommodating uh, or, or cannot accommodate all these other interest groups that are in Afghanistan. And they're by no means smaller than the Taliban. If, um, if their interests were not represented uh, in the state, um, again, uh, they could become an insurgency like the Taliban became when they were not represented in the government and they were not included at Bonn. So when we represent, when we say that we want a republic, um, we say it because we think that this is the only way uh, uh, to reach a stable and uh, 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 peaceful Afghanistan, uh, which will not have um, uh, reasons inside the country for another, uh, another war. We want the war to come to an end. Uh, okay. We want this killing and, uh, and this suffering to come to an end. Uh, and in that, to, to do that, compromises must be made on all sides. And that compromise can be made in, in the Republic. So the Taliban say that they have an approach that they call uh, talking and fighting, meaning that they will continue to talk, but they will also continue to fight. Uh, that basically means that they can continue to attack, which they have been doing. Uh, how prepared is the Afghan government to do it? Uh, and what is the critical contribution of the United States in that fighting? So if the United States pulls out, how, uh, how are you positioned to continue the fight? Because that's the reason why Ambassador Khalil Zad says there has to be a deal before America withdraws. Um, and uh, there are several people who think that that deal is not necessary because after all, when the Soviets withdrew, they did not have a deal 
about the future of the government in Kabul and the government that they had supported in Afghanistan, the Najibullah government, lasted for almost four years after the Soviet withdrawal. And it fell only because the Soviet Union collapsed. So explain to us the ground situation on the Afghan government's capabilities in being able to keep the Taliban away. If there is, if there is no, if there is no uh, conclusion to be stocks in time for an American withdrawal. Well, uh, last year, Secretary Pompeo uh, tweeted as one of the achievements of the United States that no American soldiers had been harmed um, uh, since the February uh, uh, deal with the Taliban. And, and that speaks to how uh, this, uh, you know, speaks to the capabilities of the Afghan government uh, and the Afghan security forces. Um, you know, we have been engaged in that fight since the war has not stopped. Um, you know, in fact, Taliban increased their activity. This winter was the bloodiest of all. Yeah, you know, in previous years, the level of violence and the level of casualties had been lower than this year. This year's winter, they changed their tactic to targeted killings and roadside bombs um, instead of using truck bombs and uh, suicide attacks in the cities. But they continued their violence all throughout the country in all walks of life. Um, we have been responding to that. The A and the SF has been the core. Had, has, the, has had the core responsibility for this. The Afghan National the, Security Force. The Afghan National Defense and Security Forces. Um, they have been, um, been solely responsible for, um, for all, all this protection and operations. We do seek help from the United States, and this have, was reflected in their agreement with the Taliban. Um, when we are under attack, we still rely on some of the air power the United States has in Afghanistan. We rely on um, some of their um, uh, ISR, uh, IS, ISR capabilities, you know, which we're still developing. Um, so I think um, uh, uh, you know, for our partners who may be concerned about the capabilities of ANDSF, I want to assure them that um, you should be proud of helping us rebuild our national defense and security forces. Uh, they're extremely capable. They're volunteer-based. No one has been forced to come to the uh, to, to to join the army. Uh, yet they do, and um, and they continue to defend their state that they believe in, their country that they believe in, their, their values that they believe in, um, and they are uh, a capable a capable force with all that violence raging. Um, when when uh, when we had uh, close to 150,000 uh, foreign troops in in our country. Um, and all of that burden was shifted to the Afghan security forces, and yet we're able to uh, to keep our momentum. Uh, means that there is something in place. I am I'm confident that the Afghan security forces can hold on their own. I have said this before that our problem is not in capability anymore, um, or 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 the um, it's not a, a kinetic uh, problem. It is a financial problem. Uh, what, what needs to be ensured is that we can sustain the ANDSF. Uh, now, can the Afghan government do that at current standard? No. With our own resources, we cannot. Uh, we will require some technical help and we will require some financial support for some time to see. And that's what we're proposing to the administration, to the new administration, to, uh, uh, to support the Afghan security forces, to find a way to support the Afghan security forces um, for a, a longer period uh, financially. And then uh, we, can, we can work on other issues on the side. This will also improve our prospects for peace because for as long as the Taliban and their sponsors believe that uh, that the U.S. withdrawal will result in the collapse of the Afghan government. Um, they will continue this policy that they currently have. They will have a hard line and they will not negotiate in earnest. But as soon as they, they realize that this is a long-term commitment, um, they will not be able to inspire uh, their fighters. Even now, the Taliban are having trouble. Um, uh, I, I, uh, the, the fighting that went in Helmand and Kandahar 
uh, had, re had revealed some of the weaknesses of the Taliban. First, Taliban sent fighters from Helmand throughout Afghanistan wherever they needed. So when they attacked Helmand, they believed that they would have enough forces there. Unfortunately, they didn't. Many Taliban don't believe in this war anymore. They believe that after the agreement with the United States, there is no legitimacy for this conflict. Um, the international uh, body of ulama has come uh, and, and, and issued statements throughout, except for one country, all other countries, including Qatar, um, uh, India, Indonesia, many ulamas have come forward in Kuwait. Um, they have all come forward and said that there is no legitimacy for this point, for, for this conflict. So they, the Taliban uh, uh, rank and file have been affected by this. So they had to bring fighters from Farah to Helmand to fight and also to Kandahar. Of course, fighters in Farah uh, were not uh, used to the territory, so they took a lot of casualties and were 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 um, were not happy about this. They also brought fighters from Zabul, who were not happy about this, and returned. We are seeing a weakening Taliban rank and file uh, as a result of this deal. The legitimacy is gone. As a, and also the ANBSF continues to. Uh, um, uh, to show its strength uh, despite this uh, increased level of violence against them um, and with, with little support beyond. We think that this capability that, uh, that is a joint asset of the Afghan government and, and our international partners, chief, of, chief uh, in that is the United States, has the capability to defend Afghanistan against an insurgency against terrorism and um, uh, and counter narcotics and do counter -nar narcotics should it have continued financial support. So, do we have a number in mind? For example, for those people in America who say, "Hey, 19 years is long enough. We spent blood and treasure in Afghanistan." What you're proposing is that we no longer lead the Americans to 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 spend their blood. There's already a very smaller, small American force compared to 150,000 that was there at one time. This is just a minuscule number. Uh, that that too can be phased out without difficulty uh, as long as there is a financial commitment. What kind of financial commitment are we talking about? It would obviously be relatively cost effective for the US uh, to pay for the NDSF without having to take casualties for the American side and make sure that the Taliban never come back into par with the kind of brutality that they had before. Why has that not moved forward so far, that proposal? The uh, US policymakers have two questions um, that they, or, or two sets of problems that they need to address. One is um, the number of troops in Afghanistan that are um, involved in combat. Uh, I mean, we're not talking about troop numbers who are stationed here for other purposes or protection of embassy, um, uh, uh, any future um, uh, planning of disasters, prevention of disasters, but those who are engaged in violence or in, 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 um, in, in combat in, uh, in Afghanistan. Um, that's one question to reduce that number so they no longer need combat troops here. Um, uh, I will also um, uh, caution against the, um, you know, the, the, the uh, not confusing that with train and assist because we do have trainers and assist that uh, not always is active um, military, uh, sometimes they're contractors, but we do have that. And, and it's not just Afghanistan, every country has um, uh, foreign training, advice, and assist capabilities in their uh, military forces. And the second is on the huge numbers of money spent in, in the country, again, in defending uh, Afghanistan. Uh, and they have a set of challenge, uh, a challenge of counterterrorism and counter narcotics. Now, if they withdraw these troops who are not involved in combat, um, uh, then what happens to counterterrorism? Um, and what happens uh, if, if, uh, if the space is then available to this uh, narco trade uh, um, uh, militia that, uh, 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 that once ruled in the 1990s? What do we do uh, about this? We propose that um, the United States um, and other NATO partners 
uh, channel the support it currently gives to Afghanistan through ANDSF uh, in special forms of the ANDSF, um, uh, uh, which is about $5 billion in total, four coming from the United States and $1 billion coming from our other NATO partners. Um, and we will use those resources uh, to do those three things, counter uh, um, uh, terrorism, counter narcotics, uh, and counterinsurgency. Um, the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, it will solve both of those problems for the US. They will not have to maintain combat troops. I must state that combat troops uh, is important and emphasize on that. And, and they would not have to uh, spend an, ex an amount, an unknown amount of money defending um, uh, or fighting terrorism in this region. Uh, now, uh, any other expenses they might have where, um, uh, uh, you know, for maintaining any level of troops would, would be dependent on what US policy is. So, um, yeah. so basically you're saying that, uh, that excessive focus on troop withdrawal that began with the US process of negotiation with the Taliban uh, is actually not as important for the future of Afghanistan. What is more important is determining what kind of government Afghanistan will have. You are open to having the Taliban join the government, but as one of the players, uh, as long as they agree to the greater rules that you know the views of the majority will prevail and that they cannot uh, force their uh, th their version of Islam down the throats of all Afghans, and that that will be the basis of negotiation. That that the U.S. needs to talk to you about what kind of security support they can give to the Afghan National Defense Forces so that they can phase out their own combat troops out of Afghanistan. Absolutely. In preparation for this, what we have done is we have brought all our special forces. Um, in the army, in the police, and at the NDS, together under one uh, command. Now, um, these are forces that are being trained by the best, um, uh, by Americans and NATO troops. Um, they have different capabilities, but they are um, prepared for this terrain, and they currently do almost 97% of the offensive operations in Afghanistan. Um, and and the, they, they have been effective against Daesh, they've been effective against Al-Qaeda, um, and they've been effective against the Taliban. They are Daesh also, is ISIS, right? Sorry? Daesh is ISIS for the, for the, for the American uh, viewers. Yeah. What, they, what you would call ISIS-K, they, they have been effective against all of those. And, and these are the most transparent uh, uh, institutions in the Afghan system. Um, the, uh, uh, they were built from ground up uh, by US and NATO allies. Um, and they've been trained by them. There is, um, you know, there is no question of any kind of, um, you know, corruption or ghost m numbers among them. Um, they are dedicated to the war, uh, to the fight that they have. They they must. Uh, uh, they um, that they uh, that they are involved in right now, and they believe in the core values uh, of uh, of defending their territory and their people against terrorism. And they're very capable, and the U.S. know them, know these uh, leaders and these forces very well. Now, what do you say to those who say that that is all a recipe for forever war? That, you know, as long as the Taliban are able to recruit and they are able to have their insurgents and you are able to have some financial support that keeps your forces able to fight them, uh, that there will be a war forever. Uh, and... And to avoid that, maybe a lot more concessions need to be made to the Taliban. What do you say to them? Well, if we're not prepared for, uh, for, for war, we cannot make peace. The Taliban will only use this opportunity that is afforded to them uh, for, uh, for peace to drag uh, this process along. Um, and to wait out the withdrawal of foreign troops before they can impose their rule on, on, on the Afghan people, which I know will not be acceptable to the American people and all our other partners. Um, uh, and, and, they, and they will have to make a return because I, I know the conscience, 
uh, of, uh, of our allies will not be able to tolerate uh, Taliban rule in Afghanistan. And, and unfortunately, it also means that the conflict will not end. People will not surrender to the Taliban. People cannot surrender to the Taliban. And, um, you know, it's one thing to accept them as a reality and bring them into the fold of the, um, uh, the, the governance, governance space. It's another to live under uh, their tyranny. So basically, accept the people, the people who have become Taliban, but not accept the ideas that the Taliban bring for the future of Afghanistan? We, we will, we, there will be space in the, uh, in the Democratic uh, uh, Republic of Afghanistan for uh, their, uh, for the Taliban's values, um, uh, th their beliefs, um, as any other party uh, would have. Uh, but uh, the rule or the system here would have to tolerate uh, their opposition as well. And they can, of course, convince a majority of the people to vote for them or support them and then change the rules accordingly if they can have the support of the majority. Is that the idea that you are espousing? Absolutely. Absolutely. The Taliban now, need to be responsible to the Afghan people both ways. This is not a broadcast system. The Taliban currently broadcast what they do and they, they want people to take that as their word. Uh, they say they're fighting um, uh, against an invasion when there isn't one. Um, they say they're fighting against uh, foreign occupation when there isn't one. Uh, um, they, they say they want to bring a just system, but you would find from uh, open source um, uh, research that the Taliban system is one of the most corrupt uh, systems that, that is founded on illegal mining illegal logging, the illegal taxations, uh, uh, and also uh, on uh, narcotics. Uh, now, how can someone call or a group call itself just uh, when, when that is the base of its finances and its leaders are known to be uh, uh, major uh, narco traders? And of course, they have been among their demands uh, in the process, uh, for example, in return for the uh, release of a hostage, an American hostage that they have in return, and, and while demanding release of more prisoners, uh, they have often demanded the release of uh, major narcotics uh, figures that are arrested and in prison in the United States. Absolutely. Now, the Taliban make a lot of claims, but they are not open to the scrutiny of the, uh, the, the public. And the last 20 years, Afghanistan has built a, a very open society. Um, these people are used to um, a, a, a responsiveness from their leaders and their government and their system. Um, and they openly criticize perhaps some of the most critical media outlets in Afghanistan um, you know, who question everything and are used to this and take this as a norm. Um, I think. Uh, the Taliban are, uh, are underestimating what kind of a public in Afghanistan they will face. Uh, again, I will repeat what I said earlier, they're feared, they're not respected, uh, they're not uh, loved, they're not liked even, they're feared. Okay, so have they broken from Al-Qaeda? Because that was one of the promises they made in the Doha agreement. And there was a UN report that said that they haven't. What's the state of play on that question? Again, there is independent reporting on that uh, outside of Afghan sources, Afghanistan government sources that verify that the Taliban have not broken with Al-Qaeda. In fact, our position is that they cannot break with Al-Qaeda. They are so ingrained into the, uh, the Taliban system that they will not be able to do so. And if they do, if they do um, uh, open, what kind of an emirate would it be? The Taliban, an emir cannot be an emir of just the Afghan people, an emir of the, what they call an emir of Bominin would be the emir of all faith, all faithfuls. Um, uh, now, if, if it's restricted to a geography, um, it cannot be an emir if there can't be an emirate. So yeah, it, it, and 
the fundamentals of the Taliban uh, regime. It's important to remember that uh, the Al Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden had uh, sworn an oath of loyalty to the Taliban leader at the time, Mullah Omar. And what you have said so far suggests that the Taliban, at least in their ideas and beliefs, haven't changed, even though their tactics have changed after moving to Doha and wanting to talk. Um, so ba based on what you've shared with us, uh, I'd see that there are two or three uh, suggestions coming from you. One is that the US negotiate with the Afghan government about a longer term commitment for the Afghan National Defense Forces. And that once that is there, the US will no longer need to have combat forces in Afghanistan. Uh, the second thing I hear from you is that the Taliban are welcome to be part of uh, the Afghan Republican government uh, and, uh, and have a share, uh, but they, are not, they, they cannot and will not be allowed to impose their uh, views and beliefs on, uh, on the entire country. Uh, and the third, that you want to continue to engage talking to them uh, and go through all the processes that have been put in place. Is it realistic that any of these processes will work out given the earlier two conditions? Well, the, we are not uh, dealing with hypotheticals. This is uh, the fate of 34 million people uh, in a large country in a very uh, uh, critical part of the world. Um, there is no option but to reach for what is real and, and what will work uh, 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 to bring stability to, to, this, uh, to this country that has seen enough suffering. So in a nutshell, what do you think American policy towards Afghanistan should be that works towards peace, but also towards disengagement of a military nature for the United States? Well, Afghanistan is in a different place than it was in 2001. Um, the American uh, uh, people helped Afghanistan build, rebuild our country, rebuild our institutions. Now, does it mean that some of those institutions need, ref need reforms? Absolutely. And um, uh, do, does it mean that we need to improve some of our services? Absolutely. But we have been uh, fixing the system while fighting a war. Um, it, needs to be, uh, it needs to be understood that the commitment uh, from the Afghan people is towards uh, a, 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 a democratic Afghanistan uh, that wants to be an ally to our partners who have helped us build this. And we want to build on those gains um, as we go forward. Uh, and utilize the potential that has been created. Um, we think that there is an this is an opportune moment for peace. Um, there is an opportunity for, um, uh, for the Taliban to, to take. It's also an opportunity for Pakistan to utilize, to normalize relations. And we're, we're pursuing all those avenues. Um, I think it's important that we remain ambitious on the, uh, on the political front uh, with, the, uh, with the negotiations. Uh, but also to be realistic and have our plan B's and C's ready. Um, we cannot put all our eggs in one basket and, and then uh, uh, cry over it when, uh, when it fails, if, if it fails. Um, uh, so we have to have our backups to, be, uh, to, to even give our plan A more, uh, more of a chance to succeed. Any final thoughts that you would like to share with our viewers today? Well, I think um, you know Afghanistan has remained uh, in the thoughts uh, and uh, prayers of the American people. Um, I have seen it firsthand during my tenure as ambassador in the United States. I know uh, what the American people aspire to, and I know their frustrations as well. Um, what I would like them to know is that uh, you know the Afghanistan today is a very different place. Um, than what they uh, saw and what the, what the introduction of our country was to them. Uh, the capabilities they have helped us build uh, are going to help us maintain um, a, a stable Afghanistan for a very long time to come. Uh, they have a partner in this region, a strong partner in this region, um, and uh, will continue to be. Um, we look forward to a shared future, um, a, a peaceful future, a prosperous future uh, together. Um, I am confident in the capabilities of the Afghan uh, defense and security forces. 
Um, I think um, with, uh, with this dialogue that we have began with our, um, uh, our partners in the U.S. government, uh, we will be able to create an environment that will bring that long-term stability to Afghanistan. Um, sometimes it might seem slow and uh, frustrating, uh, but the, this um, is a path that was, we must take and uh, we, we must test all avenues for uh, uh, for peace in Afghanistan. Well, it seems that the Afghan National Security Advisor, Alhamdulillah Mohib, seems ready to talk and fight at the same time. Uh, and Afghanistan, he says, is prepared uh, to do that. Uh, it needs economic and uh, assistance and long-term commitment from the United States, but may not need combat troops forever. So that may be something for a lot of people to think about here in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much, Ambassador Mohib. Thank you to the audience for watching us from Hudson Institute. This is Hussain Akani saying goodbye. Thank you, Ambassador Akani.